When life throws you lemons, you can make lemonade, but sometimes it's hard to see how. Many of us have experienced trauma from being employed and being in the fee-for-service system, and many of us also find healing in direct primary care. So on that note, if you haven't joined our Patreon community, I definitely encourage you to support the work we're doing by joining and taking a listen to the episodes that are more in-depth and featuring updates from physicians we've had on the podcast before. Doctors like Dr. Lauren Hetty, Dr. Julie Gunther, and this week, Dr. Anand Mehta. Dr. Anand Mehta is an amazing person, and he had a very devastating thing happen at his practice, Stand Up Family Medicine, last December, when his office had flooded, and then, during the mastermind last May that he was hosting, he had another flood, and he shares about this story and an even more devastating experience that happened to him right after the second flood on the latest Patreon release. And through all of the trials and tribulations that he shares, one of the great things that has resulted is that he is going to be reopening in a new space come this fall. So keep your eyes posted on social media for when he's opening, because if you can go, go just to support what he's doing, what he's been through, and where he's going in the future. So this week on our main feed, you're going to hear something a little different from the normal interview. This episode is actually a recording I did a while back when a dear friend of mine, who was also a DPC doctor, Dr. Krista Springston, was celebrating the end of her non-compete and opening her clinic in a new space herself. So this is a recording that I did during her open house. And you can see how it's not only us doctors who appreciate DPC, but it's also staff members, family members, and patients. So take a listen and hear how much this movement means to everybody who DPC has affected. Direct Primary Care is an innovative alternative path to insurance-driven health care. Typically, a patient pays their doctor a low monthly membership and, in return, builds a lasting relationship with their doctor and has their doctor available at their fingertips. Welcome to the My DPC Story podcast, where each week you will hear the ever so relatable stories shared by physicians who have chosen to practice medicine in their individual communities through the direct primary care model. I'm your host, Marielle Conception, family physician, DPC owner, and former fee-for-service doctor. I hope you enjoy today's episode and come away feeling inspired about the future of patient care, direct primary care. So we are here at Dr. Krista Springs' open house. So we have Tiffany Fry. And Tiffany, what brings you here today? Um, I'm one of Krista's close friends, and I helped her decorate, and she's also my doctor. That's awesome. And when my you, whole family's doctor, actually. <laughs> that's so cool. And what do you love about this practice that's different from the traditional fee-for-service practices? I love that I can contact her whenever I want. She's very attentive and quick to get back, and it just feels very personal with the health care that she provides and the just kindness in general and availability. That's awesome. And just those that description, I don't hear that commonly when we talk about fee-for-service. Thank you so much for sharing that today. Okay. Can you please uh, say your full name? Robert Bryant. Awesome. Robert, what brings you here today to Dr. Springston's open house? I, we want to celebrate her opening. Uh, she's a great friend of ours. We met in San Antonio, Texas, and she's my doctor as well. That's awesome. And so just knowing a little bit about her, were you guys part of the, the f- group of families that moved over here from San Antonio together? Yes, that's yeah. correct. I served with her husband, Alan, in the Air Force. That's incredible. That's incredible. So because she is your doctor, how has DPC made a difference for you with her as your doctor, as a DPC doctor versus a fee-for-service doctor? Well, she saved my life. So I had cholangiocarcinoma. And I was feeling pain in under my right rib cage. And as I was talking with her, I thought maybe it was an ulcer. And she dealt with the ulcer for about two weeks. And she said, enough of that. We need to go get an ultrasound. Mm-hmm. And they were able to see that the bile ducts were dilated. And she knew right away the cancer was there. Wow. But with just a, a regular pay for just a regular insurance covered doctor mm-hmm. I would have seen him once and then a month later I would have seen him again she, she had this taken care of in two weeks and and without that uh, I may not be here right now that's I mean there's no words to describe how incredible that is I'm so like this is amazing to be hearing you share your story 
it is so amazing and it is so it's also so heartbreaking that this is the type of access of care in my opinion and probably yours too that every american deserves every human being deserves and when you were thinking about investing in this even before you had this this these symptoms and this diagnosis what was it that pushed you into jumping on the bandwagon and believing in the model of direct primary care versus just hey I'll, i'm only going to do what my insurance covers right i think it was the access first of all i have four girls in my family and so somebody is always having some sort of ailment and it it is so nice to be able to get to your doctor when you need to and then the other thing is just dr springston herself she is she's brilliant she's up to date and you just feel like when you're talking with her you're you're getting the best care that you possibly can i love that and i'm sure that part of that comes from the fact that she's she's present, she's not checking the clock to, to see how many minutes she has left in the visit with you because she has patients waiting, but also because I'm guessing you have the time to ask questions if you need to or have your family be able to ask questions if they needed to, if they're not clear on something or if they have more questions that weren't answered in a visit potentially? Yes, that's exactly right. And she even allows herself to be open to a text or a, or a phone call. And if, if the question that we're asking requires more, then she'll call us in and, and we'll have the ability to sit down and, and talk with her. Yeah. Incredible. And as you got your diagnosis and got treatment, what was the difference like because you had her as your doctor versus trying to rely on, I need to get in touch with my specialist in the fee-for-service model? Right. So it, obviously having cholangiocarcinoma was a big shock to me and to my family. So one of the things is just her knowledge Mm -hmm. and being able to guide us through what the next steps Mm -hmm. were. Uh, Obviously, Dr. Springson couldn't take care of the cholangiocarcinoma, but she could certainly help us navigate the the doctors who Mm -hmm. were able to take care of it. And then her her access to other professionals Mm -hmm. as well. She could direct us to who she thought was a good quality doctor versus, hey, you maybe stay away from this practice type yeah. of thing. And that, that's wonderful. It, it really put us at ease as we were going through this journey. And especially when someone is having a, a diagnosis, especially one as life-changing as that, I it, it breaks my heart again that there are lots and lots of people in this country who are struggling, but the fact that you had that added level of comfort with you have a doctor who you trust backing up your care plan and helping you navigate the care plan. That's just incredible. And just that peace of mind that you did not have to worry about dealing with already a very serious diagnosis. I mean, it's just like you don't need one more thing on your plate. So I'm so glad that that was your your experience. Absolutely. My wife, Melissa, gets on the forums for cholangiocarcinoma, mm-hmm. and it, she hears story after story of folks who can't get the information that they need or get the care that they need and a small benefit to them because of Dr. Springston is my wife's able to say well this is what we did or this is Dr. Springston's recommendation Mm -hmm. and at at least that gives them a a path to walk down Mm -hmm. before they were they were lost and and didn't know what to do so we are very grateful to be able to have her level of care. That's awesome well thank you so much. It's my pleasure thank you. (laughs) Hi, I'm Linda Baker, Dr. Springston's mother. So I think this is so cool because in direct primary care, we have so much support from our loved ones. So can you remember back to when Krista was in fee-for-service, and what do you remember the conversations being like in terms of her practicing that type of medicine? I think the thing I noticed the most, she has much more freedom, but also she can give so much better care to her patients and I know they appreciate it I've talked to several patients that just love the care that she gives them and she's able to give them doing the direct primary care my husband her father was a dentist for 43 years and we were uh, you know driven with insurance and and we know what that can do and when it starts dictating what type of treatment you give that's not fair to the patient or the doctor and so she's so much more happier in this case and I think her patients are and I know her family is. You say that you know her family is what do you get to see her doing now because she's in this type of practice versus the type of practice she was in before? Getting to go to lunch with them occasionally, being to get able to go to all of their uh, school 
activities that she, not all of them but as many more than she could before and that means a lot because your children grow up so fast and they're gone and she's able to, to be with them and have some quality time with them so I love it and especially given that you shared about your husband's practice just seeing the, that stark difference even within your own family I think it's so awesome now you've been here for quite some time how have you been supporting Krista in this move to the new office well, we've been here about a month, and we started off helping her pack, pack up. We had a big pack up day one day, and then moving day, we we moved things in my husband's back of his pickup truck. We helped unpack. We I tore all my nails off <laughs> trying to unpack boxes, but and then helping her put up stuff. Uh, my job was to to organize the medicine room and uh, get all that organized and cleaned out and labeled and things like that so that they could find their medicine easy and um, my husband put together a lot of furniture so we just helped wherever we could and also just carrying the kids places picking them up from school or taking them places that um, she or her husband couldn't do that day for some reason so we just tried to help wherever we could and not get in the way as much as possible (laughs) and just going forward with her being in this new practice and new new physical location, what are some words of, of advice that you have for her given your experience and what you've seen? I'm so proud of what she's done. I'm so happy for her to get this new location and be able to have room to expand. And, and she's made it such a comfortable area for her patients to come to. And um, just to keep everything in, in, in sight as far as what's important and uh, you know, her family and her patients and everything will fall into place. Love it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So can we start with what's your full name? Alan Baker. And how are you related to Dr. Krista Springsteen? I am her father. We just, we just heard from your wife, but how many years were you in dentistry? I just retired after 43 years. Incredible. When you started... How did you run your practice? Were patients paying you in cash? Were you taking insurance? How did you start? We were taking insurance. As a matter of fact, our, we had a pegboard system. We didn't have computers or anything at that particular time. This was in 1979. And when you think about 1979 and the landscape of how medicine was practiced, how did you access your doctor? How did your family act- access your doctor? Did you pay cash or did you pay insurance back then? We had both. Yeah, we had a deductible, and once we reached the deductible, then the insurance would kick in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as you continued to practice, what changed, if anything, when it came to how you were compensated for your services as a dentist? Well, the one thing that increased was the fees, obviously, over 43 years. The one thing that didn't increase was the maximum that the insurance would pay per year. It was the same from the time I began to the time I finished, so for over 43 years, the maximums changed very, very little. And it's just incredible because many people don't get that. They don't understand that the rates will continue to go up, but the coverage will not change. And in terms of your practice, what did you love about your practice and what didn't you love about your practice? Uh, the thing that I love the most about my practice was my patients at least 95% of them. There was always the 5% that uh, made me think about retiring a little bit more so. And then just not having to deal with business aspect, employee aspect, and those kind of things. And especially after COVID, I went back to practice for about a year after that, but I was pretty much ready to finish at that time. Absolutely. And as you've seen your daughter leave fee-for-service and go into her private practice taking direct patient payment rather than insurance what do you see in her practice that you love because she's not taking insurance i just know the type of person that she is and the personality that she brings to her practice and that she will be accepting of patients and so forth in a way that is very unusual this day and time as she continues to thrive in this new physical location What words of wisdom do you have for her, given that you were in practice for over four decades yourself? I just stay the course. There's going to be ups and downs the whole time, and uh, just keep looking forward. If you're determined to do what you want to do, then go for it. She has a a great support group, too, and so I think that's very important also. Everybody doesn't have that, and there's a 
because of that, I think that will give her the confidence to move ahead. Love it. Thank you so much. So let's start with, can you say your full name? Alan Springston. And how are you related to Dr. Krista Springston? I am Dr. Krista Springston's husband. Fantastic. So you of all people have known Krista for how long? We've been married for 17 years, and we dated for two or three years before that. So we'll call it 20 years. Love it. And 20 years ago, what was she like as a doctor? Was she in like a private practice? Was she doing hospice medicine? What was she doing when you guys were first starting out? She had just entered her second year of medical school when we just started. So I was with her through the end of medical school, and we got married just a couple months before she graduated medical school. And then I moved to Delaware with the Air Force, and she moved out to join me, found a residency program. She did two years of residency in Delaware, and then the Air Force decided to move me, and so she was able to go with me to St. Louis, and she finished her residency there. Awesome. And when... When you guys were together and she was in medical school, finishing medical school, starting residency, what what was it that was driving her to be a doctor? Like, what did she love about the practice of medicine that you saw in her? So she had, I, I think most doctors don't just stumble into it. Most of them have a desire to get there. So she had scribed for a physician during her college years and really enjoyed that. Um, she felt that she could offer something to patients that she enjoyed dealing with people uh, and she enjoyed trying to you know, spread healthcare around if you will so uh, I think just that's kind of what motivated her to want to go and, and pursue medical school and then becoming a physician on her own. That's awesome and as she shared on the podcast in her first interview because of your I guess assignments wherever you guys were located she would change jobs outpatient inpatient all the things what did you see as she continued on in the fee-for-service model when it came to her practice of medicine aligning with why she went into medicine in the first place? Sure. So as I moved, she had to uproot and move as well. So it would have been very difficult for her to establish her own practice uh, as we moved. Uh, and that's something that a lot of military spouses have to deal with. And that's uh, the DOD is working to try to help with that as well, to give some, some continuity to military spouses. Um, but as she continued in the various fee-for-service practices that she was in. She did uh, emergency medicine. Uh, she did like, urgent care. She did uh, DOT type stuff. Mm -hmm. She got she got to the point where she would come home very frustrated with the fact that she's seeing these people, but she can only see there may be a half hour or an hour long appointment, but she's only spending 15 minutes with the patient because the coding is taking so much time after that or the, the stress of the other paperwork or the insurance. Uh, and so that's kind of what drove her to eventually say, I can't do this fee-for-service, or I'm not interested in doing this fee-for-service model anymore. Uh, I want to be able to, to spend time with the patients. So that's why she's moved into the direct primary care field. Yeah. So by going into direct primary care and having her own practice, she's able to focus on the stuff that, that she loves to begin with, the, the dealing with the patients, giving patients an hour-long appointment, and it's she and the patient for an hour, if that's what it takes. Uh, which she couldn't do in the in the fee for service model because there were so many other demands on her time. Yeah, from to try to kind of compare that with my profession, I fly the airplanes, and both in the military and in, now that I'm flying in the civilian world, the world of aviation has realized that I need to be the pilot. There's there's other people that need to be responsible for taking care of fueling the airplane, or loading the passengers, or loading the bags, or working on the airplanes. If I owned my own private airplane and it was a hobby of mine, I would do some of the maintenance on it. I would do some of that other stuff. But professionally, uh, it's important that you focus on what your job is. And it's essential that the mechanics on the airplanes are excellent at being mechanics. And it's essential that the, the planners are excellent at planning the trips and planning the loads and the number of passengers and the amount of fuel. Uh, everybody's got a job to do. And, and by being able to specialize in your primary job and have other support people that can, can help with some of the other aspects of it. It provides for better service, whether you're flying an airplane or being a doctor or any other field of service. If you're a you know, professional athlete, you're the athlete, right? There's other folks that are taking care of the logistics of it. It's, it's important to be able to specialize in what you do. Yeah. I love it. And again, it, it just highlights how the tenets of direct memory care, what, what fuels us all in this movement is is really getting at that, like, we are practicing and able to practice now at the highest level of our abilities, and we're able to craft our clinics and personalize them to what we wish to do. Krista's doing firefighter physicals. She has a VO2 max CPAP machine now. She's able to do things 
that she wants to, which is awesome. And she doesn't have to justify to an insurance coder or whatever why she's doing the care she is for patients. So when you see her now as a DPC doctor, especially today as we're at her new building open house, especially now that she's out of the non-compete portion, that's eyes rolling, go back to listening to her previous podcast for more on that. But how how do you see your wife and your best friend and mom of your kids and this doctor who has journeyed with you her whole medical career pretty much how do you see her now mentally and emotionally different than she was before sure so as you might imagine there are some stresses that come with that so she's certainly spending a lot of time with that but when she comes home she is not just beaten down and broken by the day-to-day grind that was her fee-for-service sort of experience where there's she loves the practicing medicine part but that was a relatively small portion of her previous job there was so much other stuff that went with it that it, it's it's grinding it's it's more fatiguing than an already difficult day should be because it's not it's not your love it's not doing what you signed on to do what you spent years and years of school and thousands of dollars training and all this kind of stuff and you're not doing what you want to do uh, it, it was it was wearing her down and yeah we certainly saw that at home and now like I said she's opened the new practice and that that's causing some stresses as well because anybody opening a new venture would um, but in general she does it with a smile, and when she comes home and she has to do some work at home, it's not the, this broken down, oh, I've got to do this work at home. It's, well, I didn't get to finish at work today, so i got to do a little bit at home, but, but it's just an overall attitude shift that's it's been phenomenal. It's been great to see. I love it. And given that there are so many people who have partners going into direct primary care, from your perspective as the partner in this, in this pair between you and Krista, what advice do you have for other partners – who are supporting their spouses, partners, moms, dads, in, in some cases, into going into direct primary care? Like, how do, you, how do you advise other people who are currently in the role that you're in, in that you're seeing your spouse go into their own venture? And it can be stressful at times. It can be challenging at times, especially if you guys have two kids under 15. How would you advise other people to think about it when they're also playing a supportive role to help these doctors like Krista flourish in their new practices? Sure, I think you need to be prepared for some changes. There's less income, at least initially, because the the goal isn't to maximize the income. The goal is to to maximize the patient care. And so be prepared for that. That is offset by the burden that is just visibly off her shoulders when she comes home. She is so much happier at work and at home and the whole life balance. And it's, it's better for the whole family overall. So just that's, that's been the most not- notable shift for us. The phone rings sometimes because patients call her because that's part of the, the DPC models that patients have access to her. But So be prepared for that as well. But it, it doesn't take all her time away from the family. And, and the time that she is with the family is, is better because there's less stress involved. So that would be the biggest thing that I've seen. I love it. And we tell people... Direct primary care is is a way of doing medicine. It's a choice. So for those people who are going into it wholeheartedly and driven by what really drove us into going into medicine in the first place, it, it is a choice, and it's so important that you share those words because people people prepare for DPC differently. Some people take side gigs. Some people financially prepare before they make the jump, whatever it is. But I think those are, those are such sage words for other partners to hear, especially as they're seeing their loved one go into this model because while it's new it is literally old-fashioned medicine sure and now we have the autonomy to do things like be present with our families so thank you so much my pleasure thanks for for your time for putting this together and uh, we're excited we're excited to see the growth of the direct primary care model obviously with her practice specifically that's that's personally important to us but it's it's neat to see the the whole concept of it growing nationwide and yeah, we're, we're excited for it to return. It's almost, it's a little bit like a return to the, to the old country doctors of, of yeah. old. Who She'll go to your house if you need it. She'll take payment in chickens. Yeah. Probably not literally payment in chickens, but it, it, it's, it's neat to see. It's definitely a more personal touch than what she was finding at normal fee-for-service medicine. Absolutely. And I just have one more question. When, when your boys see, like you determining your schedule, you can say what shifts you wish to take when they see their mom being able to do medicine the way that she wants to. Have you seen them make comments or anything about entrepreneurship or just being your own boss that that they might be able to keep in their minds as they choose their future careers sure well one thing that i think we've worked intentionally on is teaching the boys that it doesn't matter to us what field you pursue 
find something that interests you, and it, I know it's cliche to say you find a job you love and you never work a day in your life. I, I realize it's a cliche, but as with most cliches, there's some truth to it. I, I love what I do, and so I, I don't mind going to work. Krista now loves what she's doing. She doesn't mind going to work, and that was not the case three years ago, four years ago. It's, she, is, she is so happy doing what she's doing, and I think both kids see us, see their parents as enjoying work, and when Monday comes, we don't, it's not like dragging ourselves out of bed, oh no, the weekend's over, we gotta go to work. Okay, it's, it's, it's work week, we're gonna go to work, and that's just kind of what we do, but we are both happy in, our, in what we're doing, and that's what we try to convey to the boys, is find something that you wanna do, whether it's be a pilot, or be a doctor, or be an electrician, or be a banker, or whatever they choose to do. We try to convey to them, look, your mother and I have both found something that we enjoy, and that makes work-life balance so much better all around. It really makes a difference when you show up, just like you're talking about, on Monday when you're not banging your head against the wall and praying for another Sunday. Before Monday comes, it makes a difference as to how you emotionally show up at work, too. And then that leads to the downhill effect of your stress level, your longevity at your job, et cetera, et cetera, and also how other people are seeing people in your profession. So I think that when people are around DPC doctors, I mean, and you've, you've seen it yourself. This Kool-Aid is real. It, it definitely has its ups and downs, but it is, it is so freeing. So I just love that you guys are seeing it as a family. Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been great. It's been a, an adventure because it's something new for us. The DPC thing that Chris has been doing now for two years. As a small business owner, y'all went to medical school. They didn't teach you a lot of business at medical school. So there's a lot to learn, but it's exciting and it's enjoyable. And so that's making it a, a good experience for all of us. Love it. So can you please introduce yourself? Okay. I'm Michelle Cook. And where are you coming today from geographically? So I'm coming from Atlanta, Georgia, which is about 45 minutes from this office. And this is extra special because what is your profession? I am a family physician, board certified, and I am now a DPC doctor as of two weeks ago. That's incredible. Tell us, what is the name of your DPC? Sure. My DPC is Soul Direct Primary Care. That's S-O-L. The reason for that, soul means sun, and I feel like sun is the beginning and dawn of a new day. I was actually a Spanish major in college. I wasn't biology or chemistry. I was Spanish, so Spanish speaks to me. So it's a Spanish-inspired name. I love it. We are such a supportive community in DPC, but especially when we see each other in person. Extra Kool-Aid is coming out of all of our veins. When you heard about Krista having her open house, what was it that motivated you to come on down? Gosh, so many things. You just you just feel like you have to support DPC because you know how hard it is to get started. So I really respect that. And also you want to spy and see what the other DPC docs are doing. We have that phrase, if you've seen one DPC, you've seen one DPC. So I'm doing it my way, but it's so helpful to see what other docs are doing. And really through the podcast, like I met Dr. Anand Mehta. He has a practice up in Marietta, Georgia. I went to visit there, saw how he did things, and that really helped me get started. So seeing this is so interesting inspirational to seeing her and Dr. Harris collaborate, have all this space and just have so many wraparound services. It gives me a model of what I want to work for. And just with everything you say, it's all about you and how you want to practice. It's not about what the admin said you could or could not do or what is the code to cover that practice because you don't care about the codes anymore. So I love that. And that is such an imperative part of DPC because there's no excuse in every single state there is DPC in the nation. And so when you are not only hearing about what they do, but also you're seeing them, seeing their physical space. Like I remember my first clinic was Dr. Janine Roden's clinic in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz DPC. But it's, whoa, this is, there's a door that you can touch. There's a sign that says office hours by appointment only. Yeah, Yeah. it makes it real. Yeah. Yeah. And when you, with two weeks, I mean, it's super fresh in your, in your life. I think that given that all of us have really benefited because we are not the initial pioneers in this country to start DPC, there's no excuse in terms of, this is what I tell people sometimes, it's like, what's your fear? Great. Like, we have people <laughs> who can address that fear and right. demonstrate how they took that fear, harnessed that fear, and made it through that fear, and now it's no longer fear. It's exactly. a it's a thing that happened in the past that was a, a summit to climb, and they've climbed exactly. it, and they've gone on. I love when you say, like, no excuse, because I have so much empathy for my physicians who are still in fee for service mm-hmm. and you hear that a lot like you know I'm just too afraid to leave there's too much risk to leave and my message is that staying is not an option anymore 
it just isn't an option. Like, it's harmful for us, it's harmful for patients, and we've been told first do no harm. So it is hard to leave, but it's just too unethical to, to keep practicing the way that we've been practicing. And just in my month of doing, like, my pre-opening and my, um, my official opening, I can never go back. I can never go back. My patients are happier. I'm happier. I feel like I'm practicing ethically again. I'm excited about medicine again. <laughs> I hated going to work and just, like, sitting in the car dreading going to the building. Oh, my gosh, I have too many patients. How many people are not going to be able to see me today? It would just, it's not doable. It's not doable. And we shouldn't, we, d we have to demand differently. And we can't wait for administration to do it. We've got to do it. Amen. Yeah. And tell me, as my five-year-old comes up to, to say hey, I... Uh, when you are here, like I just want to point out that you are physically getting paid to be here right. in, in Peachtree City. Yeah, like yeah. it's not, we're not in Atlanta, but yet you are getting paid. What has your practice now enabled you to do because you are no longer oh in fee for service? She's rolling her eyes, folks. <laughs> oh my gosh. So fee for service, I probably didn't leave the office every evening until about 7.30. But this week, we went to Atlanta United game. <laughs> Gift of a, another doctor who couldn't go that night. She had season tickets, and I was able to purchase them off of her. And I took my son to the professional soccer game at 7.30. It could have never happened before. Also, my son started playing soccer this season, and his practices were at 6 o'clock. Oh, I was man. able to go to almost all of them. That would have never, ever, ever happened before. Fee for service, I used to have to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning to pre-chart and get my old charts done, so my mornings were productive but insane, and it was not good productivity. Now I wake up, I do yoga, I have coffee with my husband, I have my time back, so my days are still busy and full, but I can plan it the way I want to, so it's just, it's, you just can't go back after that, it's just, no way, absolutely no way. No argument, thank you so much, yeah, thank you, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mariana, I'm so excited That's to so meet you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of My DPC Story, highlighting the physician experience in the world of direct primary care. I hope you found today's conversation insightful and inspiring. If you want to dive deeper into the direct primary care movement, consider joining our MyDPC Story Patreon community. Here you'll have access to exclusive content, including more interview topics and much more. Don't forget to subscribe to MyDPC Story on your podcast feed and follow us on social media as well. If you're able, I'd greatly appreciate if you could leave us a review. It helps others to find the podcast. Until next time, stay informed, stay healthy, and keep advocating for DPC. Read more about DPC News on the daily at dpcnews.com. Until next week, this is Marielle Conception.